Good morning. Am I on? All right. I want to start off this morning, um, first of all, with a little story that uh, I came across years ago. I share this usually with my students each year, and uh, I thought it'd be appropriate to open this morning with. There was, uh, back in the time of the gold rush, a miner who headed west for his fortune. And uh, after months of, of prospecting and, and digging and sifting and, and whatnot, he found gold and he struck it rich. And he took his, his earnings and he started to head back east. And uh, on his way back, as he was getting uh, further east and further east, uh, he was down south enough on his journey back east to uh, happen to come across a little town where they were having a slave auction. And he wasn't quite sure what was happening as the, the town was all gathered around the center circle and they had a, a line of, of slaves that they had, had brought up to sell. And uh, there were men out in the audience or the, 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 the crowd around there trying to, to make their bid on what they saw as the, the best purchase or the best value. And uh, they brought their money and they were having the slaves come up one at a time and they were trying to sell these human beings. Well, as this miner came into town, he was wanting a place to, to, to refresh himself, get some food, get some water, restock for the rest of his journey. And he approached this commotion, and he, he stood off in the distance for a while and tried to just put together the pieces on what exactly was going on here. And by the time he realized what was happening, they had brought a young girl up on the stage. She was probably in her late teens, very attractive, small, small frame. And uh, they started bidding. And the price started on what would have been a pretty fair price, in, you know, as, as if we're talking about merchandise here. But the going price for a young girl of this size was a certain rate, and they started there. And, and quickly, the bids rose and rose and rose. And as the miner kind of worked his way toward the front to, to try to figure out what on earth was really going on here, he could hear the jeers and the jesters of some of the people doing the bidding on what they were going to do with this young girl. And she was very attractive, so the things that they were saying were lewd and crude and had a bent to them that was extremely inappropriate. And uh, the, bid, the bidding kept going higher and higher and higher. And finally, the miner, out of desperation and out of respect for humankind, he decided he was going to put in his bid for this young lady. He put in a bid, and now there were three people. The bid kept getting higher and higher. The miner kept countering the bids. Finally, the, the price got to a point where the two who were bidding for selfish inhumane reasons couldn't bid any higher and the miner went up and people thought he was actually joking because no one would bid that high but he dropped the amount on the table and they handed this beautiful young lady over to this dirty dusty miner and as they walked down off the platform the young lady had fire in her eyes and rage welling up in her heart on what this man was potentially going to do with her and what the rest of her life would entail. And as they slowly left the crowd, uh, they dialogued a little bit, and her responses, responses were very short and, uh, I guess you could say, aggressive toward her, her new, quote, owner. And they walked down through the, the middle of the little town there, and they walked into a little store, and the owner asked the young lady to stay outside. And he went into the store, and he started to have a, a, a little encounter, a little dialogue with the clerk at the store. And the dialogue the young lady looked and noticed was getting a little bit heated, and it turned into yelling and shouting. And finally, the owner slammed his hand on the desk, went back to the back of the room, and came out with a, a piece of paper. The Miner then handed over a, what seemed like another large sum of money, and he came walking out, and he went up to the young lady, who was looking at him in disgust. And finally, as this man is standing there holding this piece of paper that she really didn't know what was, 
She looked at him and she said, I hate you. And she spat in his face. And he took the sleeve of his shirt and wiped it off. And she just looked at him in, in such utter disgust. His boots were dirty. He hadn't looked like he showered in a long time. His beard was long and unkempt. The dusty old hat, dirty fingernails, worn out hands, a leathered face. And he looked at her and she saw something in his eyes that she couldn't explain. And he handed her this piece of paper and he said, here, you're free. I just bought your freedom. And she looked at him and she was still disgusted, thinking, why are you tormenting me? Why would you play these tricks on me? And he looked and said, no, look, I just purchased this certificate that says you're now a free person. You're free to go. And all of a sudden, the reality of her situation dawned on her. She fell down to her knees, looking at this piece of paper, looked back up into the, the, the loving eyes of this miner, and all of a sudden, the hate turned to love. And she realized that this man, she had prejudged. She wasn't quite sure who he was, but now she knew the reality of his character, and she wanted to serve him. She wanted to follow him, and she saw him as a source of protection and, and caregiving. We don't know how the rest of the story unfolded, but I know this. You can't judge a book by its cover, amen? When we think about the identity crisis we have in this world, it is hard to find a person who is genuinely honest in who they are. We live in an age of social media. We live in this age of a, a false perception of who we are, and we, we, we post it everywhere. We, we want our best on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all these different types of things. But when push comes to shove, and we wake up in the morning and we look in the mirror, we have to ask ourselves that heartfelt question, who am I really? You know, I think of Martin Luther King Jr. and his famous I Have a Dream speech. And he says, I have a dream that someday a man will be judged not by the color of his skin, help me out here, but by the content of his character. I think of three young Hebrew men back in the Babylonian captivity who had a character that was tested as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the time, decided he was going to make this image of a dream that he had had uh, just prior to this. And of course, we know the story. He had this dream and the, the head of gold represented Babylon and the shoulders and arms of silver, Medo-Persia, and all this kind of stuff, all the way down to the feet. And we know the, the historical prophecy behind that. But when Daniel explained what his dream meant, Nebuchadnezzar was fixated on one aspect of that dream, the head of gold. He was proud. Nebuchadnezzar was a very compulsive temperamental person. You can see as you read the, the narrative of his story there in the book of Daniel. And he immediately got fixated on that head of gold, and then he became a little disappointed in what followed. Well, so he decided he's going to make this statue, and his statue was going to represent that dream. However, his statue, he was going to intercede, and he was going to try to thwart God's plan and he was going to make the entire thing from the crown of its head to the very tips of its toe out of pure, solid gold to kind of slap God in the face and say, no, my kingdom is going to last forever. And so he puts up this big statue, and he calls all the Chaldeans and the soothsayers and the leaders from all over the, the, the country and the, 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 the nation at the time, has them all come together, and of course, you know how the story goes. He tells them, when you hear all the music playing, you're going to bow down to the statue. Well, these three young men knew who they were. Okay, to, to everyone else, they just seemed like three normal, young Hebrew um, captives and didn't seem any different. 
However, when the rubber met the road, their true character shone forth, right? Everyone bowed except for the three young Hebrew boys. And the part that I really love about this story, we're kind of going to go through this kind of quick because I want to get to some other points here, is that they were willing to die rather than to deny their God. Would have been super easy to compromise, super easy to find an excuse to, to lace their sandal a little tighter or reach down and itch their ankle or, you know, whatever body posture might have been appropriate for this bowing at the statue. But they didn't. Daniel as well, when he was tested with the decree that went out that they could only worship the king and his gods, right? And Daniel went forth like his custom was, three days, went up to the, the chamber in his room, faced Jerusalem, and he prayed morning, noon, and evening. He was framed. He went about his normal relationship with God. His character was tested, and he stood firm. Today's topic is called Identity Crisis. Identity Crisis. Who are you? Who am I? Are we what we look like on the outside? That young slave who looked at that dusty old miner prejudged him based on his appearance. People looked at Christ in the time that he walked on this earth, and I'm sure they judged him based on his appearance, the lack of impressive, um, you know, outward appearance was something that probably deterred a lot of people from accepting the gospel. They expected this royal king to come and deliver him from the Romans, right? But like Martin Luther King Jr. said back when he was, um, you know, protesting the, the segregation and all these different types of things, he said, content of character. He dreams of a day that we will not be judged by superficial outward appearance but by the content of who we are on the inside. I want to start off real quick, because for us to know who we are, I believe it's important for us to know a little bit about where we came from. And what I'm going to get to, just so you know where I'm going with this, is I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Okay? I'm a Christian first, but through study and prayer and enlightenment, I have chosen to become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because I believe in the movement that we have. Where did this come from? Let's take a look. Back when Christ came, okay, he ascended up to heaven and his apostles went out and they started to spread this gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? And they did this. And as, as their, their generation faded out, this whole movement came to be and this, this group of people, the sect that, that separated themselves from traditional Judaism, became known as Christians. We became known as Christians. Does anybody know where the first place was that we became known as Christians? Starts with an A. Antioch. It was in Antioch that Christians first became known as Christians. So this Christian movement started to unfold. And the pure unblemished gospel of Jesus Christ that they were sharing was one that pointed to Jesus Christ as the Son of God who came in flesh to save mankind from sin. And it also was one that was intimately connected with the law of God. Yet there was a distinct, purposeful um, effort to separate the moral law from many of the traditional laws that the Jews had kept for hundreds of years. And that was a difficult thing because when we have control and we have our hands on things, it makes us feel a little bit better. But when someone comes and says, no, let go, it's been taken care of, trust, have faith, makes it a little bit harder for us, doesn't it? I know it does for me. But that was the message. Okay, Paul went, went out and he said, you know what? We just need to have faith, and we're, we're saved by grace through Jesus Christ, okay? And his, his whole message was finding that balance between works and faith, faith and works. And as you read through Acts and Romans, some of it becomes a little bit confusing, but the crux of the matter is this. 
where we fall short, God has filled the gap through his son, Jesus Christ. And once we have faith in him as our savior, everything smooths out and we're on the right track. So let's look at this. Uh, Christianity bloomed after Christ is sent to heaven. Um, this major movement separating the, the Jewish customs and the traditions and enveloping the Gentiles into the fold as well, opening it up to the, a worldwide movement. Uh, slowly through comp compromise and for political advantage, uh, we know that, for instance, uh, Constantine back in 321 AD, he made a Sunday law and he started to make this hybrid Christian-Jewish religion to kind of temper the, the division there and wanting to bring people together in unity and compromise. And people just, some people stood firm, some people compromised. But whenever we have compromise on biblical principle, we're going in the wrong direction. Amen? Had Daniel compromised, would we be reading about his story in the Bible? Had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego compromised, would we read about their instance with the, the gold statue? No, we wouldn't. But because they were unwilling to compromise in regards to a biblical principle, they became men who were renowned for their great characters. So this uh, era that started back in the 300 AD uh, eventually evolved into what we call in history the Dark Ages, right? Okay, through the Dark Ages, uh, people oftentimes refer to the Dark Ages as a time when uh, people just, it was kind of a stagnant time. There was so much suppression, so much control, and the Bible itself, which give, is the light of the world, right? And Jesus calls himself the light of the world, and the Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ, was kind of hidden, okay? We were supposed to hold our light up on a hill so it can be seen, right? But they, as the little children's story, or a little children's song, they hid it under a bushel, right? They hid it, it was suppressed. Only the ecclesiastical authorities had the, the right to read scriptures because they didn't think it was for common people, okay? Um, Slowly this evolved, the, the Roman Catholic Church, along with political powers, combined, and they had a, a period that we know as the Dark Ages, where if you had Scripture, if you read Scripture, if you, if you went against what the Roman Catholic Church taught, said, and, and put in place, you were persecuted. Okay, you guys remember some of the, 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 the bloody instances where people were burned at the stake, beheaded, and different things for basically going against this, this political church power that was in place back in the day. Bloody Mary, you've heard of Bloody Mary, right? Okay, burning Protestants, Christians at the stake for their, their, their differences. And uh, we see that all the way through the Dark Ages. And then eventually the Roman Catholic power, um, they, they actually developed a, a thing called indulgences where you could, you could actually purchase a little sheet of paper, kind of like that miner purchased the paper of freedom for that young slave girl. You could purchase a little sheet of paper that was like a certificate that said, hey, you know what? This gets you, this gets you out of purgatory or this will reduce your time in purgatory. And you can even purchase one for your dead relatives who may have sinned in their lives and who are in purgatory so you can shorten their time there. Okay? Now, I'm, I'm saying this stuff, this is, this is just, you can find this in any secular history book. This is no slam against our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters, amen. I think I can say this because I grew up Roman Catholic, okay? There's a lot of good people in that church. We're just looking at the historical, sequential unfolding of who we are as a people. And the word Catholic actually means basically a, a common community. I, I didn't look up the, the exact definition, but it basically means oneness, Okay, um, coming together as one in, in Christ. And I think in basic definition, that can be a good thing. Unfortunately, when we suppress the Bible and we have people who are willing to compromise and put rules in place that dictate how you worship, when you worship, who you worship, it becomes a problem. Amen? And that's what took place during those dark ages. Then, eventually, there came a young man by the name of Martin Luther. Okay, Not Martin Luther King, Jr. We already talked about him, but Martin Luther. 
young man went to law school, got a little frustrated with things, dropped out, and he eventually became a monk. Martin Luther became a monk, and his, he was going headfirst, full tilt, no reserves into his monkhood, or whatever you'd like to call that. He felt empty. He felt unsatisfied. He, I mean, this guy was, this guy was like, you know, the, the Pauls of the, the day. You know, he persecuted the Christians, you know, Paul in his day, and then finally God realized his, this zealous young man had potential. Well, Martin Luther was much like that. This guy was 100% committed to being a monk, and he was going to earn his way. He was going to be the best monk that ever lived. And as he pursued this, this great grand goal of being the best monk that he could be, he felt an emptiness inside, and there was an incomplete sense of who God was, who he was, sin, how to, how to get to heaven, and all these types of things. And he finally eventually found himself going to the Bible, and as he opened Scripture and started reading, he noticed some discrepancies. And as these discrepancies unfolded, he kept looking at his church, and he kept looking at what the Bible said, and he eventually came up with 95 areas of protest. 95 points in which the Bible and the church power of his day did not see eye to eye. He couldn't understand why in the world the church would allow people of meager means to spend a half a year's wage to buy an indulgence certificate to get themselves out of purgatory, when from Genesis to Revelation, he couldn't find a single trace of any evidence of any such thing as purgatory, let alone buying someone out of it with money. And so he dug and he, he, he searched and as time unfolded, he realized that he had to do something. So he took these 95 points of argument, he typed them all out, and he went into Wickenburg, Germany, and he hung them up on the chapel there. This was a common thing for people to do. It's, a, I guess, a place of advertising, a place of the people go to debate and talk and things like that. And when he did this, it started a snowball effect. And as history unfolded, others got on board. And Martin Luther eventually, not intending to leave the Catholic Church, I might add, was kind of forced. And it started what we call the Protestant Reformation. The word Protestant means to protest. Okay, he was protesting unbiblical teachings of his church. And his goal was not to leave the church, or to cause disunion or argumentative, like, you know, situations. His goal was for people to get back to the Bible, scriptures. Two mantras came, I would call them mantras, common sayings that we think of when we think of the Protestant Reformation. Number one, sola scriptura. I believe Pastor Nathan mentioned this last week. For some odd reason, the last couple of weeks, I've heard that um, uh, several times. And it's one of the points I'd like to make here today. One of the, one of the take-homes is part of our identifying mark as Seventh-day Adventists and Protestants and Christians in general is sola scriptura, right? The scriptures and the scriptures alone. The other one, the other little mantra that became common was, I wrote it down here, faith. I can't remember how exactly I worded it, but we're basically saved by faith, okay? Um, not by works. And that is also one that keeps us in balance, right? Because it's real easy to, to, to slip back into, we can work our way to heaven, okay? Or if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, maybe we can eat our way to heaven, right? or what we don't eat. Um, but that's a, that's a dangerous mindset to have. Sola Scriptura and righteousness by faith. Those two 
foundational elements are what prompted the Protestant Reformation to unfold. And you guys know, and, and we're, we're all guilty of this, if you find out something new, you discover something great that's worth sharing, you kind of hold on to that. You kind of claim it. You want to, like, uh, get your patent on it, right? Like, this is mine. I take credit for this grand new theology. I take credit for this new invention, this new thing that people didn't know about. I want people to look at me, and I want to I get the credit for it. Well, because of that sinful mindset that human beings tend to have, and the unfolding of sequential new truths because God does not stick a garden hose in our mouth and turn it on full-fledged knowing that we will blow it up and explode. Amen? I think he does this with scrupulous wisdom as the Bible truths unfolded. A little bit here, a little bit there. You know, those 95 points of argument um, might seem like a lot, but there, there was a lot that needed to be done, there was a lot that needed to be said, and there was a lot that needed to be changed in order for people to get back to the Scriptures. Okay? Sola Scriptura, righteousness by faith. Now, this Protestant Reformation unfolded, our sinful nature gets in the mix, and then next thing you know, we have Lutherans, and then through our stubborn, stubborn human nature, we want to stay in our own little constraints, and then someone finds a new truth, and they, they want to pull out of that, and then you have, you know, all these other denominations starting, Methodists, Baptists, and Presbyterians, and this and that, and then we have literally the biggest potluck of Protestant churches that the world has ever seen. Just, you know, Google in, like, you know, churches in the area, and you're going to find a church on every corner with a slightly different flavor, right? Sola Scriptura. Martin Luther's goal was not to form hundreds, if not thousands, of different denominations. Because when we have so many different flavors, I mean, let's get right down to it. I mean, vanilla is the best, right? Amen? When we have so many different flavors, it causes confusion, and it's hard for people to make up their minds which one they want. Okay? And some of them are a blend of so many, you can't even tell what's in it. I went to an ice cream place once, and they had blue ice cream. It's like Smurf ice cream. I'm like, what in the world are people? Smurf ice cream. Who would have ever thought? But we're, we're getting to the point where we have a religion for every idea, every little element of theology that you could ever imagine under the sun. And somebody's going to start a church and start a movement. And with, you know, almost eight, what, eight billion people in the world now, you're going to have some clientele. We have created within Christendom, Babylon. It's confusing, folks. I, I, I grew up in what was called the Mother Church, right? Um, Catholic, great people. I slipped into atheism for a while because I was frustrated with some of the hypocrisies and the things that I had questions about that could not be explained through Scripture, at least from the people I was exposed to. Eventually, I started going to church again with my wife, and uh, we found ourselves at a uh, Lutheran church for a short time, and then we quickly moved on to a Methodist church. And then, as I started to actually look at this, and someone who knew more about this than me started to explain to me and point to me different truths by default, as a sincere follower of Christ, I had to make a choice. And I say this not out of arrogance, not out of pride, not because I think we have it all, but from what I can read in the Scriptures, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the most accurate portrayal of the Bible. And we, we say amen, but I hope the amen that we say isn't out of we're better than you or we have the only truth and you can only go to heaven if you're a Seventh-day Adventist because we all know that's false, amen? There will be millions of people in heaven, I'm sure, from 
every nation, kindred, and tongue under the sun. There will be, as, as we read in, through the scriptures, God winks in times of ignorance. God is patient. God is long-suffering. God loves sinners, but he hates sin. And that, that includes you and me, brothers and sisters. Amen? There's going to be a lot of people that are part of different movements, different, different sects, different beliefs. They're going to be in the kingdom because God judges us based on what we know and understand. And I'm thankful we have a God who does that. But I'm also thankful that we have a God who gives us minds to reason, minds to think, and a love letter from heaven written by hundreds of different uh, prophets throughout the ages who point us to Jesus Christ and his unblemished, undefiled gospel. I want to talk to you today a little bit about who we are as Seventh-day Adventists. We, we are a special movement and the specialness, is that a word, specialness? Oh, it is now. We're going to put that in the dictionary. Um, I believe our movement is very special because we're living in a very serious time in history. Jesus Christ is coming soon, and he's pointing us back to sola scriptura, righteousness by faith, not works. But if we have righteousness by faith, if we are righteous because of our faith in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ overcame the world, that means he can overcome me and you. And we can be perfect in the sight of God when Jesus Christ steps in front of us. And God looks, when God's looking at us and Christ is standing in before us, he sees perfectness. Amen? And we're all, we've all fallen. You know, the Bible says we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? We've all sinned. But we all have a free gift that's been offered to us. So, Seventh-day Adventists, let's break this down real quick. We're going we're gonna to try to end on these, these couple little points here. Uh, number one, let's just break down our name, Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh day, of course, refers to the Sabbath, but that's not, that, that's so surface. The reason we call ourselves Seventh day, I believe, is not because of just the Sabbath commandment. I believe it's because God wants us to keep all of his Ten Commandments. Amen? And the reason we kind of pick seventh day as part of our title is because in the book of Daniel, uh, it says there in chapter 7, verse 25, it says, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. We're not going to get into the Bible prophecy of all that, but I want to point out this. There was a time period during the Dark Ages, okay, when God's Ten Commandments were attempted to be changed, okay? Were they changed? No. God's commandments are eternal. They were in place in Eden. We're going to keep the Ten Commandments in heaven. They're going to be a natural way of life for us. We're not even going to have to think about them. But right now, God's Ten Commandments are like that mirror, right? And when you hold a mirror up to your face, you can see how dirty you are. But the difficult thing that we need to understand is that you can't clean yourself off with the mirror. The mirror points us to our sinfulness and it hopefully directs us to the only solution there is, and that is Jesus Christ. All right? God's Ten Commandments are a perfect revelation of the character of God. When we see His Ten Commandments, instead of seeing a list of rules, of do's and don'ts, I hope and pray that we see a list of divine, loving constraints from Abba our daddy in heaven who loves us and cares for us and says yes and no in order not to make us upset so we miss out on fun things, but in order for us to develop a character like his. And so the fruits of what we do are fruits that can lead to eternal happiness rather than temporary 
satisfaction. Okay, does that make sense? Let's just take a look at this real quick. I want you guys to open up your books to the book of Exodus and open up to chapter 20. And I know we're talking about the law, and that can seem kind of boring, it might seem kind of legalistic, but I think it's important. And I, I'd like us to take a peek at these. So this is the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20. They're all spelled out there. You can read through them, but we're just going to kind of glance through them quickly due to time. Now, the church that I grew up in um, was a church that adopted a different set of Ten Commandments. Okay, During the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church, with some compromise and with some help of Constantine a little bit earlier before the church really got developed, um, the stage was set and uh, there was some control and some you know the different things that weren't biblical, obviously. And so they're, they're like, you know what? The Ten Commandments are kind of the heart of... Uh, Christianity, when we want to know what, what we can do, what we can't do, kind of some rules and regulations and things. The Ten Commandments that I grew up with uh, were a little bit different. Number one, if you look uh, at the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself carved images. The Ten Commandments I grew up, when, grew up with uh, did not have that. That commandment was just kind of snipped out and discarded. Well, the problem there is that you can't have nine commandments. That just doesn't sound right, does it? You have to still have ten commandments. So to make up for the removal of commandment number two, the church decided they would split the tenth commandment. Instead of saying, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, male servant, female servant, ox, donkey, or anything that he has, we're going to split that up and make it two commandments instead of one. Therefore, we will now have ten commandments again. And so they took uh, those commandments and they split them up. Commandment number nine, they said, will be don't cover your neighbor's wife. And commandment ten, don't cover your neighbor's goods. So there, now we have ten again. We're all good. Everybody's happy. And then we go back to Daniel 7.25. It says, not only do they intend to change the law, but there's a certain specific element within the law that was very purposefully changed to get us derailed from our relationship with God. If you, had a, if you have a jealous guy over here who likes the girl you're pursuing, and he knows that every week you have a certain time and you're going to go on a date with her, do you think he's going to try to thwart that? so that you can't spend that quality time with her and develop that intimate relationship so he can work his way in and, and separate that love bond, right? Well, there's a specific part of God's law that the devil thought, you know what, we're just going to kind of wiggle our way in there and alter things a little bit through some compromise and some unrealistic reasoning, and we're going to change the Sabbath day from one day to another. So the venerable day of the sun will now be honored, and Sabbath worship on the seventh day will slowly fade away as this compromise took place. And so now all of a sudden, the third commandment, which in the Bible really is the fourth commandment, but remember they took out the second, so it shifts it up. So the third commandment that I grew up with says, remember to keep the Sabbath day. Period. That's it. No more details. It doesn't say what day is the Sabbath day or why. But if we go to the Bible, it's interesting that that is the longest, most, one of the most detailed commandments. And the funny thing is, the other one that is just about as long and as detailed is the second commandment, and that's the one they took out. Very interesting, isn't it? You see that. If you're looking at Exodus chapter 20, you can see that. The second commandment and the fourth commandment are by far the two longest, most detailed particular commandments. Interestingly enough, God knew those were the ones that we would have the most issue with. And I can remember going into church for Mass on Sunday with my family and seeing people kneeling down to statues, praying to Mary. I can still remember the prayer. Oh, uh, Mary, Mother of Jesus, blessed art thou amongst women. You know, I, I can't remember the whole thing, but that, they would, that would be repeated over and over and over and over and over, multiple times before the church service actually began. Like I said, that's no, that's no 
cut or slap in the face of our Catholic brothers and sisters. God winks in times of ignorance, but he has purposed a movement which started back in the day of Martin Luther and has sequentially unfolded, and more light has been given, more light has been received, and those who have continued to walk in the light can only come to one conclusion. If sola scriptura, righteousness by faith in this book from Genesis to Revelation, 66 books written by over 40 authors on three different continents and three different languages, this book that has been given to us by God, if we really go by this book, we will be led to the truths that our church has. Maybe not the people in the church, because we're all a bunch of knuckleheads trying to sort our way through this mess, right? And we're stubborn, and we like to argue. Amen? You can say amen to that. It's okay. But that's not why we're here. We're not here to be right. We're here to point people back to Jesus Christ, point people back to sola scriptura and righteousness by faith. There's a lot more I'd like to share with you. I'm, I'm probably about a third of the way through the material, but I know I hear stomachs growling already. Um, but I'm going to skip ahead to part two here. So we know that the Bible calls us in the end times. We read it in Revelation chapter 12. He says, here are the patients of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? The testimony of Jesus Christ we know is the spirit of prophecy. There are two parts here. Okay? Testimony of Jesus Christ and keep the commandments. Okay? We've talked about the, the commandments. If there's something broke, do you focus on all the pieces that work? Well, it's so it's okay to keep those things working well, but you want to fix the parts that are broke. So that's why we talked about what we just did. The, the, uh, the seventh day Sabbath was altered, the second commandment was taken out. We want to arrange the parts back together to the original so that they're a fine-tuned, well-oiled working machine. Okay? Now the second part, now that we've got the commandment thing figured out, God does call us to keep all ten of them. The second part is Adventist. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We're getting close to Christmas time, right? The Advent, okay? Looking forward to something, right? Adventists are people who are anxiously, faithfully awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ. We have, you know, 4,000 years of history that led up to Christ's ministry on earth. That 33 and a half years, and we really focus on that three and a half years of his actual rubber meets the road ministry. And that was cut off at the crucifixion. And of course, he had 40 days after that. And he ascended to heaven. And interestingly enough, as Jesus ascended up into heaven, it says there that... Uh, I lost the scripture verse. Acts 1, verse 11. Is, there's an, there was an angel there as Christ is ascending up into heaven. This is the, really the only part of the story that we're waiting that hasn't taken place yet as far as the gospel of Jesus Christ. The angel said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. This same Jesus who is ascending up into heaven by this cloud of angels will come again and descend and swoop the sphere of our earth, gathering up the saints, separating the wheat from the chaff, and collecting his kingdom of human beings that have remained faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ and have kept his commandments. Now, that begs the question, are we saved by keeping the commandments of God? Would you stone me right now if I said, yes, we are? Because I believe we are saved by keeping the commandments of God. I believe righteousness by works. 
and I will to the day I die. But I also know that I've failed miserably. Righteousness by Christ's works. You knew there was a twist to that. We're not saved by our own works. Why did Christ come, live, die, and ascend to heaven? Because we failed. This leads us to our little last part here. I'm, I'm skipping a lot. I should have condensed this and made it a two-part sermon. 2 Peter 1, 16 to 21, what George, George already read this a little earlier. We are in a place on, in, in, in earth right now, in earth's history, where it is really easy to be deceived. We live in a time of, of rapid-fire information. We live in a time where everyone's opinion matters, even though in deep in our hearts, the only real opinion that matters is our own. But we'll, we'll argue to the nth degree to defend ourselves. But we're, 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 we're like just tossed to and fro in the waves with, with all this kind of stuff. Second Peter 1, 16 to 21, For we did not, now we meaning the apostles at the time, we did not follow cunningly devised fables. There's a lot of cunningly, cunningly devised junk out there that's going around. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, which such a voice came to him from, the, from excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mount. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Cunningly devised fables, private interpretation, these are all ways that God wants to derail us on our road to heaven. I want to close with this little story here. I'm going way over. I can remember as a kid the ice cream truck, right? The, the obnoxious circus music, you know, the ice cream truck would come, this loudly painted little vehicle with usually a guy who looks like he just graduated from AA driving it. You know what I'm talking about. I don't mean to be mean, but I don't know where they come up with some of these characters. They must be desperate for a job. Comes rolling in in his, his nice little ice cream truck. You can hear the music. You're playing out in the yard, and all of a sudden you hear it faint. It's far away, but you know it's there. You know it's coming, and your heart starts to beat a little faster, and you look around at your, your, your friends you're playing with, thinking, am I the only one who hears it? And they start to get excited too, and you know it's real. The music starts to make a little crescendo as it gets closer to you, and it gets louder and louder, and your heart races, and you know you have just so much time to get things in order. You've got to find mom and dad. You've got to beg like no one's ever begged before. Plead for money. It's just 95 cents, Mom. That's all I need. And hopes that they will deliver. And once they deliver, because they always do, once they give you that money, you've got to run out to meet the ice cream truck. And then you've got to choose what kind you want, right? And you hand them the 95 cents and you get your little ice cream thingy with the nuts and chocolate, and you walk away with a smile on your face with the prize. Amen? Seventh-day Adventists, we have a limited time. God, who is much bigger than not only the boogeyman, but the ice cream truck, amen, is coming soon, and we should have an urgency and an excitement that is indescribably intense. Yet we sit here, lethargic, wondering when Brother Mark is going to get done talking so I can go eat my haystack. I'm actually wondering too. I'm getting kind of hungry. The point of the matter is this. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is a movement in Christendom to call all people back to sola scriptura. Are you on board? Amen.